we are going live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the platform of Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India. Today we have our chairman, Dr. John Mukopa Dasar, who is teaching us about adolescent coxa vera, which is also known as slipped capital femoral epiphysis. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Janki, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Uh, is a problem that affects the adolescent most commonly. It's often associated with endocrinal disorders. So any of these patients, when they come to you, I think you need to rule out things like hypothyroidism and other endocrine dysfunctions. But they have significant complication rates and there have been some recent changes in the concept of management. But if you look at it, strictly speaking, the name is uh, incorrect in that it should not be called slipped capital femoral epiphysis because it's actually the neck that displaces relatively to the head and goes more superior and anterior. Uh, and this is related to the rapid growth uh, that you get in the adolescent age group. Uh, there's a weakening of the physis and there are shear stresses across the physis at this stage. Now, there are a number of uh, studies to look at the uh, histological uh, issues involved, the details of the histological issues. We're not going to go into that, but suffice to say that the femoral head actually remains within the acetabulum. As you see that, the femoral head is within the acetabulum. It's the femoral neck and shaft which get externally rotated. The neck moves superiorly and anteriorly while the head tends to be posterior and inferior, okay? Uh, historically, this was first described by Pat Pare back in 1572. Uh, Mueller in 1889 called it the bending of the femoral neck in this adolescence. Uh, this is the English translation of uh, the German uh, word, which a uh, German uh, sentence, which uh, I've not put down. Whitman in 1909 actually described osteotomies to correct the deformity for some of these. And Boyd in uh, 1949 described fixation of the slip capital physis with pins. Okay, so this is the uh, sort of uh, histor his historical perspective of some of the developments in the uh, understanding and treatment of this condition. Uh, if you look at the epidemiology, it is not that common. It occurs in two per 100,000 uh, population. It's more common in males, boys much more than girls. Uh, the left, interestingly, is more involved than the right hip. Uh, maximally in adolescents during the rapid growth. So in boys, it's most common between 13 and 15. While in girls, it's at a slightly younger age, between 11 and 13. And it has a fairly high incidence of bilateral involvement. And uh, if you look at the literature, there are uh, incidences quoted anywhere between 15 to 80 odd percent. But most of the studies will give you an incidence of 20 to 25 percent. You know, what you, the main things you look for in the radio, radiology is you do the AP and lateral x-rays. And on the AP x-rays, uh, normally if you draw a line along the superior part of the neck, it should cut a part of the epiphysis, okay, on under physis. Okay, uh, now in the slip, this will tend to go over the head and not cut the physis at all, or the growth plate at all. Okay, so this is the main thing. The line is called Klein's line, and the sign is called Rethoven's sign. So there are two different um, uh, sort of terms given to the same uh, sign in a way that the line that you draw is known as the Klein's line, but the sign that this line goes superior to the physis in the slip capital femoral crisis is known as Tethoven sign. 
similarly, in the lat, you have other things like the Kepner sign and the loss of the S and the frog leg lateral. So uh, we're not going to go into all those details. I'm sure you can look it up in the books. Now the classification again is uh, classically you had the three classification three uh, uh, sort of types of uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis. You had the acute where the symptoms were for less than three weeks. Uh, the chronic, which was which is really comprises the majority of these, is where the slips are present for more than three weeks. And you have the acute on chronic where you have chronic symptoms initially and then they suddenly develop acute symptoms. So someone who was able to walk with mild pain then suddenly develops severe pain and is unable to walk. So today, uh, the, the uh, classification more commonly used is the stable uh, versus the unstable SCFE. The child who is able to ambulate with or without crutches without too much pain is considered a stable SCFE, while a child who cannot ambulate with or without crutches is known as an unstable SCFE. Now you can also classify them according to the degrees of displacement, which is mild, moderate, and severe. Okay, and this, uh, you use the Southwick femoral uh, head shaft angle to decide this. If it's mild, if it's less than 30, it's mild. If it's 30 to 60, it's moderate. And if it is more than 60, it is severe. Okay. Now, CT is the other way of doing it. And this is uh, actually more ac accurate and not, was not routinely used. But I think today uh, it is being used more and more. To one is to confirm the diagnosis. Two is to look at the degree of slip and understand the uh, actual severity of the slip as well. Now, once you've diagnosed this, what are your aims? One is you want to prevent any further slipping until the physis is closed. Okay, so your treatment really consists of uh, pinning the physis until it is closed because after that it's not going to slip. And you want to avoid complications and the biggest complication that you get is AVM and you may need to maintain hip function. So those are the things that you need to look at when you're planning your treatment. And the most common method until recently was the in-situ stabilization with a single screw or sometimes with multiple pins. Now, uh, until the time then when we were doing our post-graduation, it was felt that any attempt to reduce this uh, open, closed or any other you just stabilize them in the position that you got them with a single screw or with pins. Okay, now this had its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. Pash described uh, open reduction using a, a, what he did was did a, quite an urgent capsulotomy. So as soon as the patient came, especially with acute or acute on chronic slip, he did a partial, uh, he did a capsulotomy did a gentle uh, sort of reduction of the slip and then fixed it with pins and uh, quoted very low AVM rates with his method of treatment. The other method which has become very popular of late is the safe surgical dislocation, uh, which was described by Gans, which is used and a correction of the uh, slip is done and in, uh, which uh, actually takes off a bit of bone and puts the capital physis back in position and then you fix it. Okay, so this requires a safe surgical dis, uh, dislocation, also known as the modified done technique. So this was the paper by Pash et al. in 2009, which was about open reduction and smooth KVI fixation for unstable slip capital femoral devices. So by and large today, uh, what is the accepted method of treatment? Uh, for stable slips, it is in-situ stabilization with a single screw that has really become the treatment of uh, choice, especially for 
mild or even uh, sort of moderate slips. If it's severe, then there are some problems because later on they will cause impingement, uh, what we call FAI, femoral, femoroacetabular impingement, because you have a bump which will then cause problem. So then you have to think of something like a modified gun osteotomy. Okay. But this certainly has the least risk of AVN. Okay. In mild uh, slip, stable slips, FAI is not usually a problem. However, in more severe slips, this could be a problem. And that's why you would have to think of doing something for this. So here's an example. This is a case from Dr. Sriram, Vijay Sriram, 11 year old girl with a mild stable slip with pain in the left hip for about a month. She came walking to the clinic and you can see the signs of the uh, showing the slip. Uh, this was fixed with a single pin. And this pin actually comes from anterior to posterior because the Physis, the epiphysis goes is posterior relative to the neck. So you sometimes have to start quite far anterior in the neck so that you are in the head, in the center of the head. Okay, and these are follow-ups showing that the hip is maintained. Uh, there's no evidence of ABN either. Now, if you have a more severe slip, as in this case, okay, you can see the CT scans again showing that. You can do what is considered the PASH method, which is a mild, uh, it's a gentle open reduction and fix this with a screw. Although in PASH's technique, we use the uh, uh, K wires or pin smooth wires to fix them. So if you can get in a screw, as you can see in this case, uh, and the slip is only on one side, uh, but since the patient was uh, on the CT showed some signs of the slip happening on the opposite side, it was decided to pin both sides and this was pinned. And you can see the follow-up is having a good range of motion and uh, no evidence of AVM. So this is where it comes to the question of prophylactic pinning of the contralateral hip. As I said, uh, 20% actually present with bilateral involvement and an additional number will have a subsequent uh, slip on the, in the opposite side. And this usually develops within six months. So there is a ongoing debate. Uh, if you have some kind of endocrinopathy, such as the, uh, thyroid dysfunction, then it's definitely better to do a, uh, a fixation before it, the slip occurs because there's almost a 95% incidence, okay? While in the other idiopathic cases, maybe you can wait and watch, but explain to the patients that the moment, or the parents, the moment they develop symptoms, they should come so that there's no delay in the treatment. Okay, so here's some studies which show that you can do without treating the other hip. Uh, also, when you operate on them, there is a small but definite incidence of avian even in in-situ pinning. Okay, now, word about safe surgical dislocation. This is a method which was advocated by Gans from Switzerland. And this is a method by which you actually do a safe surgical dislocation using a trochanteric flip osteotomy. And in the author's study, they have showed a very low, almost zero incidence of avian. Uh, it has become, had become very popular, but if we look at some of the more recent papers, there have been uh, reports of uh, low, uh, of AVN which are not insignificant. So this was the original paper which showed very low uh, uh, AVN rates. Again, subsequent papers from the same group which showed a very low AVN rate. <coughs> so here's a 
15 year old. Again, you can see quite a significant slip. Uh, you can see this is a chronic slip. So what you can do is use the osteotomy, reduce the hip uh, with a safe surgical dislocation and then pin it. And you can see the follow-up showing a good result at two years. Okay. However, as I mentioned, other papers have shown more uh, complications with this method. Uh, they had 15 in this study, they had 15 revision procedures for AVM, fixation failures, et cetera, or progression of deformities, and two developed end stage degenerative joint arthritis. So, if you look at the various studies uh, that one has seen, AVM is really most common with spica cast, so that's something that we shouldn't be doing. If you just do a single screw, uh, in situ fixation, it's actually the least. Okay. So, and if you do any osteotomies, it's somewhere in between, depending on the technique you use and your uh, skill in doing the procedure. So, uh, if you look at unstable uh, slipped capital femoral epiphysis, if you look at North American and European surgeons, 88% favor urgent treatment. Okay. Manipulative reduction was favored by 32% of European and 12% of North American surgeons. And what 84% of North American surgeons favored what they call an incidental reduction. So what you do is just place the patient on the table with gentle internal reduction. You don't make any um, vigorous attempts at reducing the joint. So whatever occurs with the positioning of the limb, you accept and don't try to do more. <coughs> Again, so there are differences in the type of screw and number of screw fixations uh, uh, described by various people. Capsular decompression, again, is more uh, favored by the North American surgeons than the European surgeons. So most of the evidence is basically level four or level five and we really don't have any hard uh, type 1 or type 2 evidence to show that one method of treatment is definitely superior to the others. Okay, So one has to really think carefully to decide on what would be the best method of treatment. So here's a case, a uh, young chap with, uh, presenting with acute on chronic slip. Uh, you can see there's a significant displacement. That's the position with the safe surgical dislocation. You can see the pump here. So what you do is you have to osteotomize this very carefully, keeping the retinacular vessels which come from the back intact. Okay. Get the position right, hold it in place, and then pass screws to fix it. And then you fix the osteotomy with uh, oblique screws from the trochanter to the calca. Okay, so that's the post-op picture. This is a follow-up. You can see how it's going on to heal. And this patient did quite well at the end of two years. Here's another case from Dr. Sriram, where he's done this method using a screw and a pin uh, and an in-situ fixation on the opposite side. And this is a 15-month follow-up on this patient. Okay. You can get complications. So, this is not something you do uh, with, uh, without a lot of care. This was a patient with a very severe slip. You can see that, but it was a chronic slip. Uh, and it was impossible to, almost impossible to fix it in situ. So, we decided to do an open reduction. But I think we took off too much of bone and it ended up in a dislocation, we had to do it again, but he ended up with quite severe AVM and uh, that was a problem that which uh, he is still walking around okay. Then he had a slip on the opposite side which we reduced and that side we had no major complication but this side, the hip is not in a very good position. So now more recent papers have showed as high as 20 to 50% uh, avian incidents with this method. 
while it's much lower with the PASH technique, which I mentioned, where you just do a gentle, uh, you do a capsulotomy, open capsulotomy, joint decompression, and a gentle partial reduction. So the lower rate of area. <coughs> Similarly, other papers showing avian rates of as high as 26%. So this is a kind of a algorithm given in this paper, which talks about how you can make your decisions. If you have an acute, unstable hip, attempt at gentle close reduction. If you can get it to less than 30 degrees slip, just go ahead and pin it in that position. If the slip angle is mild, as I mentioned, less than 30 degrees, in situ pinning will stop progression. Okay. However, if the slip angle is more, you have to think of osteoarthritis, which will develop if you pin them in situ. And you may think of treatment from that, including treatment for the impingement, which could be arthroscopic or open. The more severe slips, you can think of surgical connection, correction using the done approach with the GANS osteotomy. Okay, but familiarize yourself well with this technique because I think uh, the results of most other surgeons or as more and more people are doing it do not uh, totally uh, coincide with the originators who obviously developed the technique and were very careful about the anatomical dissection, etc. when they were doing it. So I think uh, for this stable mild slip, I think there is today more or less consensus that a single screw in situ fixation is probably the best. If you have an unstable uh, temporal femoral epiphysis displacement or slip, this requires either urgent gentle reduction, decompression and internal fixation using the PASH technique or you think of open reduction using the safe surgical dislocation. So this is a choice that you have to make depending on what you're familiar with and depending on the studies that you've gone through. Remember the rates of avian for SS for safe surgical dislocation quoted by the originators is not really achieved by most other surgeons. So uh, be wary, but learn the technique well. And I think you should be able to do this with less avian than uh, maybe seen in some of the papers. Okay. So I think uh, I will stop there and take some questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so we have uh, two questions in the chat box. So the first one is asked by uh, yes, sir. So Sachin has asked what what kind of gait we expect in case of uh, this condition, Trendelenburg or short limb gait. So I think in an acute slip, the patient won't be able to walk, okay? Now, depending on the chronic slip, you will get a bit of both, okay? So there will be shortening and there will be a loss of the abductor bar. So you'll have an element of Trendelenburg also, yeah? So, uh, other question he has asked about Drayman's sign. I think that so, one then. Pins. No, sir, Drayman's sign. Uh, I think. Drayman's uh, sign. Yes, sir. Access so, this, as I said, there are a number of signs which have been described. Yes. Uh, there's the Kepner sign, there's the Drayman sign. Uh, I think you need to look those up. I don't think all of them are important. What's important is you know about the Klein's line and the Tithoven sign. And there's the Kepner's and the S. The S shape on the lateral is uh, lost when you do the problem lateral. Okay. So those are the ones. Do you know what Raymond's sign is? Uh, 
Yes, sir. So it is, I think, uh, another name of axis deviation means when we are flexing that time, it's good. Okay, the clinical findings. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so clinical findings, yes, you will get, I, I haven't mentioned that. In the chronic slips, when you examine them, you'll get the classical sectoral side where when you flex the hip, it tends to go into external rotation and you'll have less uh, internal rotation. So. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned about uh, the instability, that means it is uh, physical instability. So, how to predict sir, when it is stable uh, other than the that's, case? That's on symptoms, okay? So if they are painful, they can't walk, that is considered an unstable slip. If they are able to walk with minimal pain or with crutches with minimal pain, putting some weight on the leg, that's considered a stable slip. The other way, obviously, is to look at the degree of slip. So the 30 higher degree, the degree, what you have the mentioned. Higher, the higher the instability. And uh, so, when you uh, uh, you're putting the uh, fixation, prophylactic fixation of other hip, contralateral hip, when, how to decide about that? So that's a decision you have to take <coughs> explaining to the parents that this is a possibility. If you pin them early, then it's easy to do. Okay, it's, You can be sure that it will not slip, but it needs an additional surgery. So, and depending on the pathology. So if it is a... So has thyroid, the th hypothyroidism or hypogonadism or any of the hypopeticism, then there's a high risk of it being bilateral. So there I think it is probably you, you try to convince them as much as possible. <coughs> In those which are not related to endocrinopathies, the incidence is probably around 25%. So you can warn them and wait and watch, but watch very carefully. But if they agree to getting it done, it makes sense to do it. I think. And so, uh, <coughs> I think I should. sir, this one question you have mentioned about uh, that done osteotomy, sir. That is intracapsular one. Yeah, similar. that's why you know, that modified done is what you do with the safe surgical dislocation. You actually take off the bump at the physis itself, so, at the growth plate, along with the bone, the uh, wedge of bone that has formed. As because what happens is if you look at it three dimensionally, that's the neck, that's the head. The neck has gone here, the head's gone here. So you have a big bump in the anterior part anterior superior part and you have to take off that wedge and then put the head back in place and then pin it in that position. Okay, So you have to be very careful not to damage the retinacular vessels which are supplying along the posterior inferior part of the neck. So because if you look at the work of the originators, they were the people who started this procedure so they are very good at their anatomical dissection and they have quoted very low uh, ABF rates. Okay. However, more and, as more and more people are doing it, you're getting more AVM. So obviously your technique becomes very important when you're doing this. You have to make a retinacular flap and things like that. I think uh, for the uh, viewers, also it is important to know that safe surgical dislocation class was taken by Sir about a year back and it is available on YouTube that can just to me. Uh, so there is one question asked by Dr. Subhansu, which is that hormonal therapy effect on progression of SCFE and on managing it. So it if, you, if, if you detect the problem, that has to be treated. Okay? So if there is hypothyroid, you need to treat that. Yes. However, you also need to treat the slip. Okay. And so, uh, as you have mentioned, sir, two things. One is uh, safe surgical dislocation and another one is in-situ fixation, which avoid 
AVN. Uh, there are three what? things actually. The safe surgical uh, dislocation, okay. this PASH technique, which is a capsulotomy, decompression of the joint and gentle sort of gentle reduction. Okay. So you just gently try to reduce it without doing any major surgery. So you may just nibble off some of the bone and then reduce it and fix it. And the other is a in situ fixation without worrying about the uh, position of the slip. Okay. So, uh, can you know, let us know a little about in situ fixation? What is important? How it is done? So, in situ fixation, if you look at it, think of where the epiphysis will be and the neck will be. Okay. So, neck is like this, the physis will be in this position. So, to get into the center of the head, you very have to, if you start where at the normal place, you will end up anterior to the head. So you have to start very anterior in the trochanter, and sometimes actually in the neck part to be able to direct your screw towards the center of the head. And usually you can only get one screw which is in a good position, but that's enough to stop it from slipping further. Okay. Uh, don't put these patients in hip spiker because usually they have the highest risk of AV. Now, Japanese also have a method by which they keep them on traction for some time before taking them to the OR. But that's not something which is practiced by most people. So, uh, as you have shown in few figures uh, that uh, there is one screw and another one is a K wire. Yeah, so, so you can't get more than one screw. So if you want to supplement it, you add a smooth KY pin. Or there are some other pins like the Knowles pins, etc., which have been used in the past. Okay. Uh, one thing about the timing of fixation and timing of wearing bait post-operatively. How to decide about time of weight bear. So, so with decide. children, there's no rush to weight bear them. No? It's unlike an uh, adult or a, especially a geriatric neck femur where you want to mobilize them early. I think here you them on bed rest for some time before mobilizing. Generally keep them on bed rest for four weeks to six weeks before mobilizing. So, uh, is there urgency in any case, sir? So, in acute on chronic slip, because the, it's very painful and the child can't walk, it is considered urgent care. In a chronic slip, it's not so urgent. So, stable, not urgent, but don't wait too long because you can get an acute on chronic slip, which then becomes unstable. But uh, as unstable slip, you need to do it as soon as possible. Doesn't mean middle of the night, but early next day or within a day or two. Sir, uh, while evaluating, sir, uh, is it always necessary to take a frog like lateral view or just a AP view is also? So ideally, you should. Sometimes you can't diagnose it without the lateral. But with today's day and age, where you can get a CT, then if it's an acute, uh, very painful slip, sometimes doing a lateral may not be so easy. Although you can usually get a frog leg lateral. Okay. But with the CT, it tells you, gives you the information. There's some, uh, this thing with MRI for early diagnosis as well. There's some MRI signs of early diagnosis, which will show you very early slips as well. So it's not something to use normally. Yeah. So I think uh, most of the things. Okay. Uh, yes, I, think, uh, I don't want to carry it on too long today. So, hopefully, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, it is great, and thank you, sir.